thank you for tuning in to the Leadership Forum, a space where you will hear perspectives from global industry executives on human ingenuity and how they catalyzed it to unlock value and realize the organization's true potential. We will keep it real. We will hear what's worked well and learnings from instances where things could have worked better. I'm your host, Sakib Ali, partner at Spiderworks and Explorer. Say hi to the future, the fast-growing community highlighting the human side of ingenuity. Our guest today is Brent Foley, partner at Triad Architects and founding partner at Triad Facility Solutions. Welcome, Brent. Thank you for taking time out from your well-architected schedule. Brent, let's uh, let our listeners hear in your voice how you would wish to introduce yourself to them. Uh, yeah, my name is Brent Foley. I'm, as as uh, was mentioned, I'm a partner at Triad Architects and Triad Facility Solutions. Uh, it's my job to help lead a team of architects primarily. That's our main business, uh, architects and designers to design um, projects that impact community. And then we also provide some facilities management uh, and construction services for our clients as well. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Brent. Uh, Brent, um, you know, you have been a multiple times repeat offender as it relates to say hi to the future. You have <laughs> you have come on this podcast before. You spoke at the Columbus event last year. And each time you show up, you make us better. So thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me again. Always happy to be here. So, Brent, there were two statements as I was doing my prep um, for this episode um, about Triad. That sparked my curiosity. One was, we believe that design begins with people because inspired people do inspired work, right? So that that was one. And then the second one was, we connect vision with community. And both of these got me all curious. So help our listeners with some perspective on inspiration and connection to community in how Triad works, delivers for its clients? What's the process? How do you measure it? Sure. So philosophically, uh, in, in the design world, um, we've we've always seen that there are, are people that lean one of two different ways. There are what we see as high design people, uh, which is the stereotypical, uh, you ever read the Fountainhead, Howard Rourke uh, architects that... Uh, uh, that it's all about their vision. It's not about the client. It's not about the people. It's about what they see. Uh, and then on the flip side of it, there are kind of the very technical types of architects that really fall more on kind of the engineering side of problem solving. Uh, and so ultimately, we believe design is where um, both problem solving, efficiency, effectiveness, and creativity and inspiration meet. Uh, and so we believe projects start with a vision or a, a spark of inspiration. So a client will come to us with a spark of inspiration. And we've developed a process to make sure that we identify the challenges associated with that vision or inspiration. So what's in the way? And that's where design starts. Design thinking is all about problem solving. So we start by thinking about what's in the way. Uh, and then we think about who are the people that we need to talk to to understand those problems. And so our, our process goes from Verify alignment, which means we're going to talk about the vision. What are the goals? We're going to then identify the challenges and the stakeholders associated with those challenges. So that's kind of that inspiration vision side and starting of the design problem. And then we move into the people side and we say, okay, let's build a custom engagement process. So we design schools. Example of this, we did an elementary school. We talked to every student at the elementary school that we were replacing. We talked to every teacher. We talked to community members. And of course, the process of talking to those people was different. Right. And they, they had different things they wanted to talk about. So we built custom processes to, to engage with them. And then we do what we call here, listen and document. So that's where we really sit down and talk about um, what they see, how they see it, the insights we need from them to understand the challenges that they're facing. So we move from vision and inspiration to stakeholders and community. And from there, we move over into the design side where we really go back analyze and develop solutions and then communicate those solutions. And then our process is actually a flywheel because we know as soon as we solve those three or four challenges, we knew uh, we identified about five or six more challenges and we just continue that process. You've got a scientific method to it and, and <laughs> that's fantastic, right? I mean, uh, but, you know, as you, you were speaking about the elementary school or any other example that you might want to take, um, give me a couple of those sparks of 
this is what you thought was going to happen, but it was very different and you had to check and adjust and, and whatever. Like, I'm just, I'm just curious about, because this sounds very interesting. Yeah. Um, I'll follow, I'll stay on that elementary school. Right. And so uh, for that elementary school, the site had a existing middle school. And so the site had been designed for one school and we were about to add two schools to it. Um, and the challenge was going to be, how do you fit all that on there? How do you deal with the traffic? So we had a, one of the meetings we had was a community meeting. And we decided in that instance to put site plans down in front of random groups of community members, teams of four or five, ask them where to put the building, uh, where to put the playground and where to put the parking. And we kind of worked around the room and helped them discuss and come back to it. Um, and we really thought it was going to be very technical and we were going to learn a lot about those types of technical parts of the process. But there was a really interesting spark moment because what we do afterwards, we have them do that and we didn't tell them this is they have to come up and present. And there was a gentleman who came up and presented and said, um, you know, I was here because I don't want the speed limit to slow down on my street because it already takes me too long to get to work. And I didn't vote for this, this levy. I didn't want this school building. But Sally and John here, their grandkids are going to go to this school. They're going to walk across the street from their school, uh, from their house to the school. Uh, and if we're going to do it, we got to do it right for, for those grandkids. And so what was really fascinating to watch in that moment was that, that moment of empathy that was built. And I, I was expecting a lot of no voters to show up and we were going to have to do a lot of backpedaling of why we're doing things. But the, the surprise was the empathy that was built. And now all of a sudden these people that were probably opposed to this project were now collaborators. Uh, and so that's a, that was the best example I can think of off the fly of, of a surprise moment. And then what it did is it really informed our site plan from a technical standpoint. We said, okay, we drove down into that. Well, what do you mean they, they have a hard time walking across the street? And we knew that this intersection had to be realigned with this intersection and got very technical uh, but it, it became a uh, much less contentious process than I thought it was going to be. And it became very much of a collaborative process. It's amazing. That's <laughs> so fantastic. Um, you know, Brent, uh, again, having spoken with you uh, enough times now and, and uh, having a bit of an insight into the triad process, because uh, we went through that as well when we were with you, um, I understand how the, uh, the ingenuity plays into it from a project standpoint, right? Um, what I'd like to do is switch that a bit and, and put you in your partner role as the leader of your organization. I'd love to get your leadership take on ingenuity and more importantly, the human side of ingenuity as it relates to you, your organization's success um, in how you have to um, work with your team members. Uh, what's your take? When has it worked well? When has it not? What have you learned yeah. in the process? The ingenuity side of leadership for me is, is uh, I'm a quick start. So it's about experimenting, right? And so with experimentation uh, comes uh, failures and successes, uh, of course. Uh, but the key part of leadership is you're not a leader if people aren't following you, right? And so uh, people are essential to leadership. Uh, you can't be a leader without people. And so how do you get people to follow you uh, is is a is is really an interesting thing to figure out, and I learned a lot about leadership not in my role as a partner of Triad, but as in my role of um, president of a local Rotary Club. Um, and so, I was a project manager at Triad at that time; wasn't uh, owner yet. And as a project manager on a team, you get to tell people what they're going to do. <laughs> the uh, engineer, you're going to do this. Structural engineer, you're going to do this et cetera, et cetera. Um, in a volunteer organization, you have to inspire people to know that what you're asking them to do is something that they want to do and that it's important to do. Uh, and so how do you inspire people uh, it was the lesson I learned. That's evolved over time. Uh, and I, I was a failure at first when I was trying to lead that Rotary Club because I was just trying to tell everybody what to do. Um, and as I've evolved that, I, you know, I've become a, a believer in transformational leadership uh, theory. Uh, which has four components. First, you have to provide individualized consideration. Everybody's different. Uh, what's going to work for somebody, one person isn't going to work for another person. Uh, the second thing is you got to provide intellectual stimulation. People have to like not just be bored in their work. The next thing is you have to provide inspiration and motivation. You got to really challenge people. You got to push them out of their comfort zone to grow. 
uh, and the last one that I learned that I think I think a lot of leaders get those first three, but the one that's most important is what's called idealized influence. So they have to know that you're never going to ask them to do something that you wouldn't do yourself. Uh, you have to set the example. When you say you're going to do something, you have to do it. Uh, you have to um, have basically high moral authority uh, for them to believe in you. Um, so that's that's what I've come to think about when it comes to leadership and people. And the ingenuity comes then, well, individualized consideration. I got to experiment with Joe or Sally differently, uh, depending on them. What might be, you know, intellectually stimulating for one might be different for the others. Um, what inspires one or challenges one might be different for the others. Uh, but then continuing to set that example for all of them as we move forward is, is that, kind of the best answer as a question I can think of. Very cool. And I mean, you know, it seems that um, you've this this system works for you uh, and you've made it work for Triad because you guys right. are a very successful company. Um, how do you, how have you thought about uh, those becoming values within the organization? So for the next person in, um, how are they also gravitating to this or frankly coming up with their own system, whatever that works for them, uh, back to individualized considerations. Yeah, yeah. Um, who knows, they, you know, this particular formula that's working for Brent so well, um, you'd also want everyone to be empowered to come up with their own formula. So how, how do you how do you think about that? So you said, I think the key word there, and that's values, right? And so um, every organization in their strategic planning comes up with a set of values, right? Five to seven items that they say uh, define how the people in the organization operate. Many times those values are written on the wall and that's all that happens, right? Um, but I think what becomes critical in a firm is the culture and, and, and to build culture, you have to operationalize the values. And so our values, um, what we've done is we've written the word, but then we've written a series of imperative uh, sentences that tell you what it means. What does it mean to be authentic? What does it mean to have integrity? Uh, what does it mean to be to be analytical? Um, those types of things that are our values. And so then, if you think about the people in the firm, uh, you want to hire people based on those values. So as we're trying to evaluate people, we evaluate them against those values because any people that can do the job is not hard, right? The technical sides of things, people have training. Getting people to do the job in the way that you want to be the triad way to do the job is harder. And so if you can start off in the hiring process and evaluate the people on those values, that's the first step. I think the next step is um, evaluating them uh, in their uh, regular evaluations to their values too. So our, our quarterly evaluation process isn't just about your performance on your scorecard metrics and are you getting your goals done, uh, et cetera. It's like, okay, how are ways that you've been authentic this quarter or not been authentic? Our ways that you've been analytical this quarter or not been analytical this quarter. And if somebody isn't meeting the benchmark, we set a benchmark for values, even though they might be hitting our other performance metrics, they may not be a good fit for the company. And so we had an instance where we had a person that we had to let go that was a bad value fit. We tried to coach that person there. Um, and what we learned through that process was that um, the morale of the company went through the roof. Um, so it's also how you terminate people. The long way for me to say, the way to make it flexible uh, is also just to make sure you're building culture and team, right? And so if flexibility mm -hmm. and those things are part of your cultures, you need to have evaluation processes that promote the type of behavior that you want. <laughs> uh, and that's not specific in um, a metric, like you're going to have this many meetings with clients, salespeople, uh, you're going to have this many with clients. It's, it's more about how are you showing up on a day-to-day -day, uh, to be the right person for the firm. Does that answer your question? I think I went around the corner a little bit, but I think I got no, it. No, I, I, yeah. I, I don't think you went around the corner. Actually, and the place where you went around the corner, you made me see something more, which which I had not uh, thought about, which is, you know, I don't, I like, I, I uh, my past experience with Procter & Gamble, we had our PVPs, the, the Purpose, Values, and Principles. Um, and uh, we used to, we used to live our values, yes, but the way you've just spoken about um it's not just that you evaluate performance, you also evaluate fit on a regular basis. Um, that's uh, that that's mind opening, right? I mean, I don't know how many organizations actually take it that deliberate, intentionally uh, evaluating people, not just against performance potential, but also against value. So I think we might need to we might need to think that through and 
bring that into the vernacular yeah. somewhere. Well, it gives you um, a strategic advantage because it does. The technical side of of strategy, there are so many great people at that. But what we know is the a, a team of decent performers who work as a team, who are efficient, effective, can predict what the others are going to do, know exactly what they're going to do and what the others can do, can be the team of all stars who don't work as a team every day, right? And so if you have that culture and you have that uh, set up, you have a strategic advantage in the, in the marketplace. I think th there's, you know, there's another area that I'd, I'd love our listeners to uh, get shared. Uh, I'd love our listeners to hear it from you um, and in how you share it, which is, this whole conversation around how you do your internships from the community um, uh, and, you know, the, where where you go out and you look for people who are, now I can almost imagine your rubric for it, because it's not just about technical skills. You're also looking for the fit and the fit might not be in the normal places where you look for. Uh, right. They might be in in places that you, you know, one might not. Have. So. Tell us a bit more about that part of, of Triad in terms of how you engage with the community to bring people on. Because yeah. I know I've heard it, but I'd love our listeners to hear it as well. Sure. So uh, there's, it's actually funny because this brings it back full circle to that same elementary school. Uh, so we have, a, we have a robust internship program. Um, we also are highly engaged with the Center for Architecture and Design, uh, which has architecture camps, uh, other architecture programming that's all about getting young people uh, interested in architecture, which we're using as a tool also to make sure that underrepresented groups are seeing getting exposed to architecture and creating pathways to um, to architecture. But a, a um, real world example of that in action is one of our interns, Akeem. So uh, we are in involved in a program with the local career and technical school that has an architectural and construction management program. They happen to be in this, embedded in that same district where we were doing that elementary school. So when we were doing uh, our engagement sessions, we invited the architecture and construction management students who were high school students at this time to come watch the engagement process. We wanted to teach them that design and architecture is more than just the technical, more than the high design, it's the people that you're designing the project for. And um, as I mentioned, we met with students, we met with teachers, we met with community members. Uh, in the sessions where we were meeting with the students, um, we were doing things like activities to get them thinking about architecture and how the space affects how they learn. We have them clap their hands to understand acoustics, look at the window and talk about natural light. And we were doing these sessions and the architecture students uh, were watching. And we decided, hey guys, do one of you wanna run the next classroom that comes through? Do one of you guys wanna do it? And a keen raised his hand and he said, I'll do it. And Akeem killed it. He did it better than we were doing it, right? And, wow. and I was like, okay, Akeem gets it, right? He gets it. And so I identified a cultural fit from there. And Akeem was a junior in high school. And I said, Akeem, we don't usually bring juniors in for internships, but can you come in every Wednesday and we'll have you in as an intern? He came in as an intern for that, that summer. He came back as an intern the next summer. Uh, Akeem had some technical challenges with his transcripts where he had to take a, a year off between uh, uh, high school and college. So he came back and he was an intern first for the whole year before he started college. Uh, very proud of the He got a full ride scholarship or not full ride scholarship. Well, maybe a full ride. He got a very nice scholarship to Kent State University, went to Kent State University and he comes back every summer as an intern. And to your point, it wasn't that Akeen had the best grades. It wasn't Akeen that was, Akeen was the best student. I saw the way he interacted in that process with those other kids. And that's where I realized he was a good cultural fit for our team. And so I think that's a good part of talking about how you're mining talent. You, you know, you have to be out there in ways to see people uh, doing things that aren't the technical, right? That aren't the typical types of things and seeing if they are going to be a cultural fit. Amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, you know, our, our, as I keep looking at, uh, and I know Sonia is giving me my uh, <laughs> heads up on, on where we are from a time standpoint, um, but Given that journey that you've had, have you ever had a chance to reflect and look back and said, if I were to do this again, would I do it any differently, Brent? Oh, we always think about that, right? Um, of course. Um, the, the engineering design side of me wants to say yes, right? Oh, I could have done this. I could have tweaked this. I could have done this. 
Um, but the reality is our failures, our trials, our tests, our tribulations uh, shape who we are. And so if I hadn't gone through any of the different parts and pieces that I did, I wouldn't be who I am today. Uh, I'd be a different version of who I am today, but I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't have been at that Rotary Club and learned that I need to ins inspire people. I wouldn't have met a teen and, and learned those things. So the answer is no. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm a person of faith. Uh, I'm, I'm a member of the Baha'i faith. And we often talk that um, your character, your soul is, is uh, uh, the, the steel is born in fire. You know, the, the prettiest rose, you have to you have to prune the thorns, right? And so we are built through our challenges and our things. So as, as much as I would like to say, man, it would have been great not to know, had gone through that or gone through those different things. No, I wouldn't change it because I wouldn't have learned the things I needed to learn uh, to be where I am today. That's one of the best lessons that you can leave uh, for anyone, Brent, and for all our listeners. It's it's great because, yeah, I mean, whenever we look back, we say, okay, you know, if only I could cherry pick only my successes and just do more of those, well, those successes wouldn't have been successes had those dips and failures not come about because they are what sets you up for that next thing that you were trying to do. So amazingly said, thanks. Um, what about, um, what about you know, I'm sure... Um, in your current role and also uh, being an active member of the community, there are places where you go and you, you, there are other CEOs and other partners and other leaders who might be looking to you for inspiration. So what would your advice be to other senior leaders out there? Um, to make sure you're taking care of yourself um, as a leader. Um, you know, uh, it's, it can be challenging to be the leader. Uh, it takes a lot of emotional um, labor um, you have to you have to remain strong and, and show confidence in adversity. Uh, you have to at the same time come off as authentic and real and show a little vulnerability. Um, and so I think that just making sure that you um, continue to work on yourself. Um, uh, I, I somewhere I heard one time that there's four capacities. There's time, intellect, uh, physical and emotional. We all talk about the time component, right? We all have so much time in a day to do a work. We all know that if you increase your intellect, you can do things faster, so you can increase your capacity. We all know that if you have physical endurance, uh, you can you can do more things. But the emotional part's not talking about talked about a lot. And the reality is, if you can have good emotional capacity, uh, if you can compartmentalize things, if you can understand and not get obsessed over things. You can be more efficient, uh, effective and more efficient as a leader. So just make sure you're taking care of yourself. Make sure you're, you're eating well and working out. Make sure you're, if you need to talk to a therapist, talk to a therapist. Don't be afraid of those, the, those things. I think we have, um, particularly in America, I'm not up, up north, um, this, this rugged individualist mentality uh, that often many CEOs and leaders of organizations feel like they have to be tough and tough through it. Find people to talk to. Find other CEOs. Find other leaders. Create a group of people that you can you can confide in. Confide in. Do whatever you need to do to make sure that you are your best self, uh, because then you're going to be a better leader. That is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and and you know we're we're exactly just about getting to our end of this. Uh, thank you again, Brent, for taking the time and sharing your insights. Our listeners would love to hear more from you. We will tag you and Triad in our show notes. Um, but before I let you go, is there anything that you may have come into this conversation thinking, here's something that I'd love to share and Sakib just never got onto that or never <laughs> asked that question. So please do take this time and, and this is your time. Is there something yeah. that you wanted to share with our listeners? Yeah, actually there, there is. Um, so I have a, a friend locally uh, named uh, Christopher Celeste. Uh, and he is the son of former Governor Celeste, uh, who was the governor of Ohio. Um, and Christopher has a storied career in politics and also in uh, as the CEO uh, of helping companies, organizations become uh, better. Uh, and he has a book called Leaders Lead Themselves. And there's a great quote that I always like to, to end on that I think would be a great one. And he talks about uh, the alchemy of generosity. I think as, the, as a leader, this is something we have to think about because of the desire for power and control. But what Christopher says is the alchemy of generosity dictates that the more power and opportunity we cede to others, the more our own multiplies. 
And so what we mm. what we need to remember is the more opportunity we give to others, the better our life's going to be. Alchemy of generosity. I will definitely take that away. <laughs> um, thanks. Thanks a lot, Brett. Thank you so much. It was so great to be here. And we'll talk to you guys soon. I'll see you in Columbus soon. <laughs> see you in Columbus soon. To say hi to the future podcast series, new special new Romero, edited by Matt Fenner, and special effects by Ed Fenner. Please leave us your thoughts and let us know if there's a guest you want to have a conversation. You can find all the future podcast series on Apple Spotify and YouTube. 